Thank you very much, uh, Rob, for that kind introduction. Uh, I should say two kind of an introduction. I'm not that engaging a speaker, but, uh, and, I, and, and, I, and I won't have all the answers, but, I, but I'll certainly try to address the ones that I can uh, address. It's very encouraging to see a full house or nearly full house. Uh, I'm sure it's the topic and not the speaker, but uh, nonetheless, I'm very encouraged to see all of you here uh, from across age groups, and so it, it, it's great to have, to have you all here. I should express my sincere gratitude to Science for Peace and in particular for Meta Spencer. And it's, it's really, it's really, I am in awe of all that Meta, that Meta does. I mean, to keep this going and she's been kind enough to, to invite me to, to give similar lectures over the years. And uh, it's, a great, it's a great privilege for me to be here, Meta, and thank you indeed very much for this. So the topic of, of uh, my talk today is the Iranian nuclear deal otherwise known as the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. And this is a deal that was, that was after much uh, uh, protracted ne negotiations, it was, it was finally announced on July 14th of this year. I think it is not an overstatement to say that it, this is one of the most consequential uh, developments in the nuclear disarmament realm in, in decades. For all the perpetual, seemingly endless talk about CTBT, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, about FMCT, the Fissile Material Treaty, about the, the, the humanitarian initiative, all important issues, but that have little concrete developments to point to. This is really one concrete development for the international community. I think it's, it's a very welcome uh, accomplishment for, for, for diplomatically and, and just for the security of, of all states. It is uh, also not an overstatement to say that the, that the stakes surrounding this deal were quite high, as high as they can be, not only for the, for the region, for the Middle East, but also for the, for, for the entire globe. The geopolitical consequences of, of having reached an agreement or the flip side of the absence had an, uh, an agreement not been reached would have been, would have been, been quite significant. So I think it's, it's, uh, it's something that certainly merits our attention, our insight, our scrutiny, and, uh, and it's, uh, but all in all, I think we should all be grateful as international citizens that this agreement did in fact, did in fact come through and it was, and it was uh, uh, reached. As with all agreements, especially as with all recent agreements, I mean, the key, qu the devil is in the details and the key question is, relates to implementation. So you can set, you know, as, as worthy of, as objectives as, as you want, but the key measure of its effectiveness will, will, is still to be known and it's still to be determined and will be known through its effective implementation. And not only Iran has a, play, uh, a role to play in the, in the implementation of this agreement, but in fact all parties that, 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 that had a role to play in, the, in this agreement. Uh, this is a multifaceted topic that each of the, uh, its different dimensions could warrant a separate lecture. But I will, I will attempt to give you a bird's eye view of the key issues to be considered when assessing the, this agreement and, uh, and hopefully uh, have a better understanding of why, uh, why, 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 why it should be supported. My position individually and that of Project Plowshares institutionally is to welcome the agreement, to warmly welcome the agreement. We are very pleased that the international community was in fact capable of, capable of reaching the, this agreement in spite of strong opposition for, from certain quarters. And, and to, have, to have been able to, to overcome this opposition, this recalcitrant opposition, and to actually reach this agreement is, is, is really something to applaud. So, so that's, in a nutshell, my position. We, we surely welcome the, the agreement. So let me start with saying a few words about the context, just to, 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 frame, to frame the conditions under which this agreement was negotiated. Iran, the, the Islamic Republic of Iran, is actually one of the original signatories to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. As you know, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty is often referred to as the cornerstone of the nuclear non-proliferation regime or I should say the nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation regime. And uh, <clears throat> as an original signatory, and in fact, in fact uh, as other states' parties to the, to the, to the NPT, to the no Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, there are two key implications that I think are relevant to this, to, to this agreement. One is that there is a commitment to non-proliferation. 
And secondly is the right to peaceful uses of nuclear energy. And some folks, rightly so, view the, uh, a certain tension between these two implications that pose uh, uh, serious governance challenges. And how do you, how do you reconcile these two, these, two, these two obligations or implications of the NPT regime? Uh, I should say that these apply not only to Iran, but, but to, to any, other, any other state party, to the NPT. Uh, the reason these implications are important is because, uh, well, the root cause of the agreement uh, relates to the first, that, uh, that uh, Iran uh, has, has committed to forego the, the acquisition of nuclear weapons, and, and, and the grand bargain back 45 years ago was that those states that had nuclear weapons would, would commit to disarming, and those that did not would refrain from acquiring, acquiring them. You fast forward 45 years, and by and large, despite Iran's case and other sort of tension points, by and large, non-nuclear weapon states have effectively lived up to their, to their end of the bargain. They have not acquired nuclear weapons. If you look at the flip side of the coin, the nuclear weapon states who committed to disarming, not only have they not disarmed, but they have actually invested uh, uh, billions of dollars in the modernization of nuclear arsenals. So there, is, there, is a, there are some tensions there just in, in, in that point. And I'll get in greater detail to that uh, later. But also the right to peaceful uses of nuclear energy. This is very um, uh, problematic in a way because once a state acquires a, 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 a nuclear infrastructure for, for peaceful uses of uh, nuclear energy, the technology, the, 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 the wherewithal, the know-how, the expertise is very similar to that that is required for developing nuclear weapons. Uh, Sramesh Thacker, a name that may be familiar to some of you, has, has explained it. To illustrate this point, he says that once a state has, has developed the infrastructure to, for, for peaceful uses of nuclear, uh, nuclear energy, they're just a, a, screw, a screwdrivers turn away from weaponizing. And that that's, might, might be a bit of an oversimplification, but it certainly illustrates the point that the capability is inherent in any state, not just Iran, any state that has a, nuclear, a peaceful nuclear program, a peaceful nuclear energy uh, industry. So there have been some concerns about Iran, about, uh, and these date back to, to before 2003, and, and I'll say a few words about why 2003 is significant. But generally speaking, there were some concerns, and, and I should say legitimate concerns. I, I do feel that it, it is important to keep uh, Iran in check, and, and it is important to make sure that, that uh, precisely because of how dangerous and ha these weapons are, uh, nuclear weapons are, uh, no other states should be allowed to, to, to acquire nuclear weapons. But I would go further. No state, period, should be allowed to, to have nuclear weapons. So, so while it is important to keep Iran in check, and it is very important to make sure to stop the, the spread of nuclear weapons, we, we must always, and this will be a recurring theme throughout my, my, my brief remarks here, we should always bear in mind that they are as unacceptable for the, uh, for the rest of the international community, including the P5, including the countries that currently have nuclear weapons, as they are for Iran or any, any other would-be proliferator. So these are, these are, these are weapons that are, that are acceptable in nobody's hands. And the, the short form to, to that has been used traditionally to refer to this is that there are no right hands for wrong weapons. So nobody should get to have them, not just Iran. So there were some concerns, and, and they peaked uh, just before 2003. So there was a, a, a growing stockpile of, of uranium, uh, some of it enriched to 20%, which isn't quite yet uh, weapons-grade uranium, which is tra traditionally understood to be at, at 90%. But still, this was starting to raise some eyebrows in the, in the, <clears throat> in the late 90s and the early 2000s. There were, there were reports of an increase in the number of, of uh, centrifuges, uh, including new generation machines. These are the machines that are used to actually process the, the, the uranium. There was, uh, uh, it was discovered that there was a deeply bunkered uh, facility, an enrichment faci facility at Fordo. And uh, the fact that it was deeply bunkered obviously raised some concerns about the secrecy surrounding, surrounding these research uh, and these activities. There was another separate reactor at uh, Iraq in, in, in Iran. There were limitations on the inspections that the International Atomic, uh, Atomic Energy Agency was able to complete within Iran. And uh, there was a reluctance to implement the additional protocol of the IAEA. Let me just say a few words about the, the, the last two uh, points, the limitation, because they're, they're related to each other. 
Iran has traditionally allowed inspectors, and in fact has, ha has undergone one of the most intrusive inspections regimes in history uh, on any uh, uh, disarmament related, related uh, field. But it was generally, generally restricted to declared facilities. It was declared facilities. So, so Iran said, okay, you're the, the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, is free to check here, but there, was, uh, there were increasing questions about, the, uh, an increasing number of questions about undeclared facilities, the, the facilities that Iran was not making available to the IAEA. And there was an, uh, a reluctance to implement the additional protocol, and this is a, a protocol with the IAEA that allows for more intrusive inspections that were already in place. And by more, more intrusive, I mean short notice. They could, the, the inspectors could re, literally at a moment's notice show up at Iran's doorstep and, and say we want to inspect anywhere we like. And, and Iran was not as forthcoming and, and well, there was, again, a reluctance to, to, <clears throat> to embrace such uh, inspections. Part of the arguments made by Iran is that no other country on earth was or had ever been subjected to such intrusive inspections. Mm -hmm. And, the, and other, some of the countries that were subjecting or that were pushing for, the, for such intrusive in inspections would not themselves allow that level in, of intrusiveness in their countries. That said, it did raise some, uh, some eyebrows uh, and there were some legitimate concerns about the secrecy and why would, Iraq, why would Iran, the Iranian government, have an underground facility at Fordham? Why would they build uh, other research reactors? And, and all the evidence seemed to indicate that the capacity, even if the claim from the Iranians was that it was exclusively for peaceful purposes, that the uh, capacity vastly um, exceeded the, any reasonable need that they would have, for example, for cancer, cancer uh, research purposes or other peaceful purposes. So there were some red flags. Uh, nonetheless, again, there, is, there was uh, uh, some hesitance or, and some reluctance from the Iranians to allow th that level of intrusiveness. There were a few assessments made, though, about, the, about, the, about Iran, and, and you might be surprised at some of these, because if one thing has been constant throughout the Iranian ordeal is that uh, there has been a lot of misinformation, a lot of crying wolf, a lot of, a lot of alarmist exaggerations related, related uh, to, the, to Iran's nuclear program. So while it is true, and, I, and I'd like to emphasize that, while it is certainly true that there were some questions about Iran's nuclear, nuclear program, that is not tantamount to say that there was an imminent bomb or an imminent smoking gun as some media and some governments and some, and some alarmist uh, depictions of the case have may may have you believe so as early as 2003 the US director of national intelligence said that the intelligence community had a high level of confidence that no decision to weaponize had been made in Tehran so while there was an acknowledgement that there was the capability the inherent capability and there was so there were some un unanswered questions and there was the there was some research pre 2003 about about nuclear weapons, the possibility of nuclear weapons. It, it was the assessment of perhaps the best intelligence community in the world that no decision had been made to, to weaponize. In 2007, fast forward just a few years, and there were the, the US national intelligence estimate said that there was high confidence that, uh, that uh, in the fall of 2003, Tehran halted nuclear weapons activities. This includes research into nuclear weapons, and the, 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 what would be required for a breakout capability, the technical expertise, et cetera, that that had been halted. And also in 2007, the intelligence community assessment said that that halt had lasted at least for a few years. So that sort of uh, uh, runs in the face of some other, uh, uh, other, other uh, depictions you would hear, including from the US government, about how imminent the Iranian bomb actually was. Other assessments. WikiLeaks in 2009, the big scandal, Julian Assange, etc. <clears throat> That Yuki Amano, which, uh, who was the, the, the chief of, of the International Atomic Energy Agency, was solidly in the United States court on the handling of Iran's alleged nuclear weapons program. So this, uh, this again, has, has, been, has been repeatedly highlighted by the Iranians as evidence of, a, of an anti-Iranian bias from an organization that is supposed to be completely neutral and, 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 uh, and, and be technocrats, if you will, and not have any political in inclination one way or another. Uh, 
I should add that, that Mr. Amanu's predecessor, Mohamed El Baradei, has stated on the record that he has seen no evidence of a w nuclear weapons program uh, in Iran, even after such intrusive uh, inspections. To be clear, the International Atomic Energy Agency has never definitively claimed that Iran has or has ever had a nuclear weapons program. But it's the opposite. It has not been able to fully certify that, he, that it does not have a nuclear weapons program. And it's, it's a subtle but important distinction. They have not been able to, 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 to clear them, but they are not also not making the accusation that they have, they have engaged in a, in a nuclear weapons program. Uh, part of the reason why they, they have not been able to certify whether or not nuclear, uh, Iran had a nuclear weapons program has to do with the inspections regime and the issue of undeclared facilities that Iran could potentially, as could any other nation with a nuclear weapon program, could in hiding, uh, concealing it from the rest of the world, be actually pursuing a nuclear weapons program. But, the, but uh, yeah, they've never made that claim. So there, have been, there has been, as I stated earlier, a lot of misinformation and a lot of alarmist rhetoric. And I don't intend here to, to minimize the, the, the gravity of the situation or to minimize the, the, the gravity of the threat should Iran in fact be, be uh, uh, intent or have been intent on producing nuclear weapons, but just to give you a historical overview, a historical perspective, a snapshot, and this is not an exhaustive list of how, alar how this alarmist rhetoric has really not contributed to a, to a climate of truth in terms of decision making, in terms of media scrutiny, in terms of civil society engagement, because you hear these alarmist uh, notions that, it, you know, any day now, it, we're just, it's just a matter of time before we, we get sort of a, a uh, mushroom cloud from Iran. But that, but time and again, these alarmist uh, speculations, I would call them, or lies, uh, depending on, 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 on how cynical you might be, have, have proven to be wrong time and again. So as early as 1992, uh, when he was a member of parliament in, in the Israeli Knesset, Benjamin Netanyahu, he predicted that Iran was, and I quote, three to five years, three to five years from having a nuclear weapons, which just by basic arithmetic, by 95, 20, 20 years ago, Iran would have had a nuclear weapon. They still have not produced a single nuclear weapon. And no authoritative observer or scholar believes that Iran has ever had a nuclear weapon. And I've seen polls in the, among the U.S. population, for example, where you know, a significant proportion of the population actually believes as a fact that Iran has nuclear weapons, when in fact they do not have any nuclear weapons. Uh, also in 92, Shimon Peres, former uh, foreign minister of, Indra of Israel, predicted that an Iranian nuclear warhead would be, would be, that Iran would have a nuclear warhead by, by 1999. He made these claims to, to French television. 19, 1999 came and went, and still no smoking gun or mushroom cloud. 1995, the New York Times quoted U.S. and Israeli officials saying that Iran would have the bomb by 2000. 2000 came and went, nothing happened beyond Y2K and some computer glitches, but nothing related to an, to an Iranian bomb. 1998, Donald Rumsfeld, uh, former Secretary of Defense of, of the United States, known and unknown, uh, if, you, if you recall, uh, he warned the US Congress that Iran could have an intercontinental ballistic missile that could hit the US, actually hit the US by 2003. That never happened. In 2003, the Jerusalem Post uh, reported that uh, Iran would have an operative nuclear weapon program by 2005, two years uh, after the, the report came. Uh, that didn't happen either. 2009, Netanyahu told the U.S. congressional delegation that Iran was one or two months away from a bomb, and that didn't happen. So you get the idea. 2009. The chief of Mossad, this is the intelligence agency of Israel, said that unless their program experiences technical problems, the Iranians will have, by 2014, a bomb ready to be used. That, again, proved not to be the case. 2010, Netanyahu said that a messianic apocalyptic cult was controlling atomic bombs <laughs> at the time in Iran. And this is a direct quote, and that was not the case. 2012, Netanyahu in leaked cables said that Iran was a few months away from a bomb. That didn't happen. 2012, you may recall Netanyahu at the UN General Assembly with this, with this cartoonish 
figure of a bomb with a red line saying that Iran was to, <coughs> that it was imminent, that the bomb was imminent and still no smoking gun. At the same time, that same year, some leaked cables released by Al Jazeera said that Israeli intelligence uh, had determined that Iran, quote, was not performing the activity necessary to produce weapons. And just this year, The Guardian, highly reputable newspaper in Great Britain, reported that leaked cables showed that Netanyahu's Iran bomb, bomb claims contradicted, were contradicted by his own intelligence community. <laughs> so again, it's a, it's a, it's a for, Decades we have been hearing that Iran was months away from the bomb and there has been no bomb and that's uh, that's actually a very fortunate <laughs> occurrence that there has been no bomb and 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 uh, once again I don't want to to understate the gravity of the threat should there be a bomb but also when you start putting the, the dots together you start seeing a pattern of alarmist rhetoric of an alarmist discourse that once again does, does a disservice to an honest appraisal of the situation of the security situation of the geopolitical implications of this uh, of this situation um, just to reiterate something I, I said when I started Capability is not tantamount to intention, and this, uh, and here I'm not, even, not not just talking about Iran, but this is just a general observation about every state party to the to the MP, MPT that has some form of a, of a of a peaceful nuclear weapons program. So, to be clear, energy. excuse me. A nuclear energy program. Yes, 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 indeed, <laughs> nuclear energy program, a peaceful nuclear energy program. There is no such thing as a peaceful. It's a bit oxymoronic, <laughs> but uh, yes, nuclear energy program. So to be absolutely clear, under the NPT, it's not illegal to have a nuclear weapons capability. Mm -hmm. Among other reasons, because by definition, it says to have a nuclear energy program, have an inherent nuclear weapons capability should they decide to break out. If a country has a solid civilian nuclear infrastructure, it already has a nuclear weapons capability, and that is no, not prohibited under the NPT. You may, uh, you may argue, you know, in perpetuity, the convenience of even allowing nuclear, en uh, nuclear energy, but that's besides the point. I mean, and maybe in, a few, in the future, the MPT may or may not be amended, or they may, there, may, there might be a, a, a stronger push from civil society or certain governments to abolish everything nuclear, including bombs and energy. But for the time being, yes, <laughs> for the time being, uh, the reality is, the fact of the matter is that nuclear energy is in fact allowed by the NPT and that by definition in, uh, uh, entails that, uh, that countries will have a certain capability to break out. Iran is not alone in, the condition, in its condition. Countries like Argentina, Japan and Brazil have advanced nuclear energy programs and they could presumably break out. Uh, Particularly, there's, there's some uh, assumption of bad faith on, 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 on whoever is doing the, the assessment. But, uh, and several countries uh, like Iran have not, well, in, this has changed as a result of the agreement, but like, like Iran in the past have not signed the additional protocol to the International Atomic Energy Agency. They have not, and they have not, they do not, they simply do not allow uh, for a regime of very intrusive inspections, such as the inspections that are, that are expected uh, of Iran. So again, other countries could potentially uh, break out. So it is in this context that uh, I finally come to the, to the topic of my, of my talk. So it's the deal, the junior, the, the junior, the joint comprehensive plan of action. So I, the, my subheading there is a triumph for the, uh, diplomacy and it's, it's not casual that I, that I use that, that wording because it is indeed a diplomatic triumph, especially at a time when, when modern diplomacy has, has, has come in under so much fire for its, for, its, for its shortcomings, for its failures, for its inability to, to reach such agreements, for its inability to, to prevent armed conflicts, for its inability to, pre to prevent killings, violence, etc. For once, it seems that diplomacy actually worked. And, and it's, it's, uh, it's really uplifting, I think, just from a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an observer to see that happen, especially when you, when you consider the alternative, which, is, which, uh, <coughs> which would, would have had predictably dire consequences. And, and, uh, and uh, military conflict was very much on the table. That was not alarmist rhetoric, that was real. 
and it still continues to be. And the alternative to a deal really could have been could have been military action in one of the most volatile areas of the world, and we would have had spillover for, uh, uh, consequences for the rest of the for the rest of the world, no doubt. And so, and, and the Middle East is already. I mean, it, it, the last thing it needs is another another reason for conflict. But it it's uh, it's it was a real possibility. And again, that's not an overstatement. Just, uh, I, I, I have a quote there uh, here from a foreign affairs article. Foreign affairs is a very reputable magazine. This is not foreign affairs position. It's just an author, Matthew Kronig, who, who had a, a piece in foreign affairs. And to, to, to illustrate the false dichotomies that were out there, the false choices that were presented to the international community in terms of how to respond to the, to the situation in Iran. So he said that the United States may still have to choose between bombing Iran and allowing it to acquire a nuclear bomb. And this is a complete, utter nonsense. I mean, the, as, as if the international community had to be boxed in into, into these, two, these two problematic choices. He, either you bomb Iran or Iran gets the bomb. And, 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 but as the deal has proven, there, were, there, were, there was a third alternative, which was, uh, which was in fact, uh, diplomacy. Even after the deal was reached, however, uh, savers have not fully ceased to rattle. And you have seen the, 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 the bitter opposition in terms of American domestic politi politics, for example, from the, from the Republicans trying to, b making every effort to scuttle this deal. You have seen the bitter opposition from Israel, from, uh, from Benjamin Netanyahu trying to scuttle Obama's legacy. And the, the, these, are, these are friends, and he's doing everything in his power to undermine what is perhaps Obama's greatest <laughs> legacy of his presidency, and he's doing so openly. And these are friends. So this, so, 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 and they, they continue to say that, that, that a better deal could have been reached. And it's, it's hard to conceive, to understand, to comprehend what they really refer to when they talk about this deal. I mean, they seem to be referring about this vague ethereal deal that, that, that inhabits some, some weird space. But it was certainly not reachable by the best, best diplomats in the world from the most powerful countries in the world who had every interest to get every concession they could. And this is what they could get. So the assertion that there could be a better deal, no, there couldn't have been. This is the evidence. This is what the international community could get. This wasn't some, some team of, of, of um, you know, middle ranking diplomats or junior diplomats or rookie diplomats from who knows what, what country. These were the best diplomats at the Secretary of State level with the full weight and authority of their president from the most powerful nations on earth. And this is what they could get. So this, this assertion that, that, uh, that if only more military pressure had been, had, been, had been put on Iran, they would have made concessions, it's, it's really illogical. Now, arguably, with enough military pressure, you know, they, 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 their logic seems to be that, that, that Iran might have made concessions that no rational actor would make anyway. And, you know, if they put a gun to your head, you will, you will admit to kidnapping Lindbergh's baby or something. I mean, with enough pressure. But that is really, not, that's beyond the purpose of diplomacy. Diplomacy really is for mutually beneficial outcomes for, uh, for all parties involved. So, so some of the criticism really is, is uh, wrong-headed. So let's look at the basic facts of the joint comprehensive uh, pl uh, plan of action. So the key players, Iran, of course, the United States, United Kingdom, China, Russia, France, Germany, and Israel. I put Israel in bracket because it, it wasn't directly part of the negotiations, but it has been so active in terms of, of the lead up to and the, and the, and the, and the aftermath, please. India? Yeah. yeah. Well, several countries had an interest in, 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 in having a successful outcome of the deal. But, the, but the, 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 the official negotiations, if you will, which were between what, the, what was called the P5 plus one, which were the five permanent members of the Security Council, the US, the UK, China, France, and, and, uh, and, um, Russia. and Russia, plus Germany and Iran on the other hand. And, and I, 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 I was hesitant to include Israel as a key player, but I, I think it, it'd be hard not to include Israel as a key player because it has 
openly, and I, I think they would consider themselves to have been a key, a key player because they have, you know, tried, made every effort to have an influence in the deal, and to some extent they have. And it, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was, um, it wasn't assured that it was actually going to, be, to that the U.S. was going to live, uh, to live up to its end of the bargain, precisely because of, of Israeli uh, uh, interference in the in the in the negotiation and in the aftermath of the deal. So these were the key official players, the venue, Vienna, um, uh, the, the Vienna International Center uh, at the, at, uh, the, 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 where the, uh, the United Nations office uh, in Vienna is located, as well as the International Atomic Energy Agency. The deal itself, the official name, the J Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, released uh, on July 14th of 2015. And once again, it was the best deal that negotiators could reach. Now, this is sometimes to take uh, be uh, sometimes taken to mean that it's is, you know, well, that's your opinion. That is the best deal that that the, but the, the negotiators could reach. But but uh, my point is that it's not a matter of opinion. It's not a matter of speculation. This is the best deal that they could, they could uh, they could reach. And the evidence is the deal itself and the fact that they couldn't reach after years of protracted, uh, protracted negotiations, they couldn't reach a better deal. They couldn't, they just, this is what they could uh, accomplish. So, the, so, so it is in fact the best deal that they could reach uh, uh, given the, the geopolitical circumstances, given the players, given the individuals, given, given the current context under which it was negotiated, that was the best that they could, they, they could produce. So that should be taken really as a matter of, as a matter of fact. <coughs> So what are the key provisions of the deal? So Iran's stockpile of low enriched uranium will be reduced by 98%, 98%. This is not weapons grade uranium. This is low enriched uranium, the one that is typically accepted as being used for peaceful purposes. Even so, they agreed to cut it down by 98% from 10,000 kilograms to 300 kilograms, and this will be guaranteed for the next 15 years. Iran will be limited, or has agreed to be limited, to enriching uranium to 3.67%, sufficient for civilian nuclear power and research, but not for building a nuclear weapons for 15 years. And this is, this is not based on trust, and I will get to that in a, uh, in a minute, but this is based on the most intrusive verification system known to man. These, the, 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 the fact that, uh, that uh, uh, checking Iran's compliance with, the, with these uh, provisions. Iran will, will place over two-thirds of its centrifuges in storage, and the enrichment capacity will be limited to one single plant at, at uh, Natanz. The centrifuges uh, there will be first generation, not the more modern type that it, uh, it had at one point. And Iran will give up its, 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 the, its second generation or more modern centrifuges. The Fordow facility, the underground bunker facility that I mentioned at the beginning uh, of, of my remarks, uh, will stop enriching uranium, again, under strict verification, and the facility, facility will be converted into a nuclear physics and technology center. Iran will implement the additional protocol agreement, and this will continue in perpetuity for as long as Iran remains a party, a state party to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. So the additional protocol I also mentioned at the beginning of the talk, which is this very intrusive inspections regime where basically the uh, IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, can go wherever, whenever, and on short notice. So basically Iran can, can sort of uh, hide any, any wrong, uh, wrongdoing, or, or it would be extremely difficult for it to, to do so. And a key provision is, is often referred to as the snapback provision. If Iran violates the agreement, any of the P5 plus one can invoke a snapback provision under which the sanctions snap back. The way it works is that if any party to the, to the treaty has suspicions or is not for whatever reason satisfied with Iran's compliance, and then they, they, they have 30 days to demand compliance. If within those 30 days, Iran, they're still not satisfied with Iran compliance, they, they, they can bring it to the Security Council. Now, it doesn't, even if there are, there are in nations that have vested, in, vested interest in Iran after 10 years or after 10 months, it only takes one of the P5 plus one to block the, 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 the lifting of the sanctions. So uh, just to be clear, they take it to the Security Council. 
So once they take it to the Security Council, the Security Council has to issue a resolution that says that the, sanction, that the lifting of the sanctions will continue. And any one of the, of the P5 plus one can veto that resolution. So even if the other four or five have interest there, it only takes one to veto the resolution. So by default, they, in practice what this means is that anyone can veto the lifting of the sanctions, but they can't veto the, the, um, the continuation of the sanctions. So by default, they, they will be sanctioned once, once they have raised concerns. And then they, they will have to agree that the, sanctions will, uh, that the sanctions relief will continue. Now, to be sure, the sanctions relief and these figures that are thrown out there, which are somewhat accurate, I mean, and, and no one has the final figure, but they say at least 50 billion that will, will be, sometimes you read, given to Iran. These are Iranian assets. These, uh, this isn't the international community somehow coming up with 50 or 100 billion dollars to give to Iran as a reward for, for compliance. This, uh, this is a thawing of, of, of Iranian assets that have been frozen in overseas accounts that they're going to allow Iran to actually take what's rightfully theirs uh, from, from oil revenues but also from, from um, other sources. A key criticism, and this relates uh, a little bit to your question, is what, what's, been, what's, uh, what's been known as, uh, as the 24-day rule. Uh, basically, in case of a disagreement regarding the inspections, Iran, uh, Iran and the International Atomic Energy Agency have 14 days to, to come to resolve the dispute. 14 days. If they don't, there is no agreement possible. This is referred to the, to the to all the parties that, that that were the players in the in the that s is is uh, doesn't go belong there. The the <laughs> J Spock is something else actually in, in space. But uh, the Joint Comprehensive Pass uh, Plan of Action. So they must decide within seven days. And after those seven days, Iran has three days to implement uh, to implement the decision. And after that, if it is not implemented to the satisfaction of the, of, the, of the parties, then they can snap back the provisions. So this is where the 24-day uh, rule comes from. Critics have argued that, that, that Iran could deliberately, you know, extend every inspection to 24 days and thereby, you know, uh, 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 concealing nuclear activity. But uh, the, and that's where the 24 days come from, 14 plus 7 plus 3. But the response to that is that it is extremely difficult to conceal nuclear activity in 24 days. Some people say even in 24 years, it's hard, to, very hard to conceal nuclear activity. So for one, this is not expected to be the norm and it can be shorter. It's just in case of disagreements in terms of, in terms of, of inspections, and it's the maximal, maximum allowable period that this could take, but it doesn't necessarily mean that this will be the norm for every single inspection. So again, this time frame that some critics have argued will give the Iran the opportunity to conceal every, uh, any wrongdoing. So a, co a couple of responses in that respect. First, it's very hard to believe that negotiators like, didn't realize that the, had this been a loophole that they wouldn't have thought about it. I mean, it's not like after the deal when Netanyahu says they have 24 de uh, days to conceal any wrongdoing and the, and the, and the P5 plus one, you know, oh, we didn't think of that. You know, the, the, they have 24 days to conceal any wrongdoing. This was, this was, you know, a calculated dispute resolution mechanism and, and surely they took into account their own technical expertise, their own, their own means to detect to detect uh, uh, nuclear activity when, when this time frame, time frame was, was, uh, was uh, established. Yusat uh, Boot, uh, he's a, a nuclear physicist and he's, he's had various positions. Currently he's at BASIC, the British American, um, British American Security Information Council, anyway, something like that. He says that even a nanogram or one billionth of a gram would be detectable. So it's, so, so these, again, these are, these so-called loopholes really are, are anything but. I mean, there is the IAEA and, and, the, and the, the countries that took part in the negotiations leading to this agreement had every confidence that any concealment would be, would be, um, would be detected within that time, uh, time period. And a lot of, and, uh, I'm not a technical expert, but a lot of people would argue even beyond those 24 days, it would still be detectable. But it's, it's, there's every technical means uh, to detect it. 
Plus, there's a possibility of snapback sanctions. So even if, it, if Iran were to, you know, recklessly risk, uh, you know, this, this uh, the going, reverting to that suffocating sanctions regime that, that brought it to the negotiating table in the first place, I mean, then the, 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 the powers that be, the other, the P5 plus one, would have every option of, 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 uh, of, uh, of, of uh, snapping back the sanctions, uh, if you will. So it's, it's, um, it's really an overstatement uh, or, or it's really misinformation to state that these are loopholes of any kind. These are, these are calculated concessions, calculated risk, and, 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 and uh, at every step of the way, including uh, the sanctions relief itself, will be contingent upon verified compliance. There has been no sanctions relief so far in terms of, of, of giving Iran anything in advance. Everything will be contingent on compliance and, and uh, verified compliance. So so there is, there is, uh, the, there are no such uh, uh, loopholes, and and you know there may, be, there is conceivably a scenario where Iran will risk everything to to you know to conceal their nuclear activities, and they will risk you know going back to the sanctions, and they will risk uh, military action, uh, and that could very well happen. But but given the circumstances, this is this is really as airtight an agreement as as you could possibly expect under 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 the circumstances. Um, one additional element to this is that beyond the nuclear question, this agreement really has represented, you know, a, a, a rare example of, of, of rapprochement between Iran and the West. And, and, and that alone, I think, is worth, is worth uh, trying, to, trying to maintain in the long term, you know, that, 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 that Iran doesn't necessarily have to be this isolated state. I mean, there is no reason for that. And, and, and there, are, there is every reason to, to, to wish for normalized relations between Iran and the West, and, and not only at, 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 the, at the leadership level, but just at the, at the common citizen level. I mean, there is uh, there is a lot of documentary evidence that that indicates that sanctions, in the end, affect uh, the regular citizens and not the not the leadership. There is there is there is practical problems when you break off relationships with a country like Iran, like Canada did when it, when when it, it literally expelled the Iranian diplomats and, and severed diplomatic relationships. So beyond the nuclear angle, I think that. Uh, that there is, there is merit to this agreement in terms of sort of the normalizing relations, relations between Iran and the West. Now, the fact, the, the fact that the deal should be welcomed, that it is the best possible deal, that it addresses a legitimate proliferation concern, doesn't mean that, that, that we are to overlook the double standards upon which it is founded, and, and certainly not me, and, and I'm, I'm per personally irked by the double standards that, that are perpetuated time and again with, the, with, the, with this, uh, this sort of deal. So, so, uh, so I think it's important to keep in mind uh, you know, the, the, the broader nuclear abolition and the broader nuclear disarmament context, context beyond the microcosms of the, new, of, the, of the Iranian nuclear deal. So let's look at the players again and look at the, the, the number of nuclear weapons in the ter territories uh, of each of these players or each of these states that had a, had a say in, in, the, in the nuclear deal. So the, the United States, 7,200 warheads. The United Kingdom, 220. Russia, 7,500. France, 300. China, 250. Germany, 20. And it's not a nuclear weapon state under the NPT or outside of it, but it is it is, it is part of NATO and as a NATO member, which has a policy of, of extended deterrence and, and collective security, they, there, are, there are in its territory, there are US nuclear weapons. Israel, 80 bombs. Of course, Israel has a, pol a policy of opacity where it, it, it neither confirms nor denies that it has nuclear weapons, but everybody <laughs> knows that they have nuclear weapons and they have at least 80. And Iran, zero. Iran has never had any nuclear weapons. So really, uh, once again, beyond the benefits, beyond the normalization of relations, be beyond you know, trying to keep this, this, this regional issue I mean, from flaring up and having, having dire consequences the world, the world over, it's, it's, 
important to remember, you know, the profound double standards um, upon which it is founded. <laughs> Virtually every state at the table urging Iran to, 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 to abide by the, by the mo strictest possible co uh, conditions. Some of, some of these states actually advocating for military options and, uh, and repeatedly saying that every option was on the table, including military attack, have nuclear weapons themselves. So, it's it's not to not to you know be apologetic for Iran or anybody, but you know if you're in that position, you might say, where do you get the nerve? Where do you get the audacity to ask me to to give up what what uh, what you have? Uh, um, uh, Ahmadinejad and, and I'm no no fan of Ahmadinejad, but he put it so simply one day. I believe he was at the UN or something. He said in, in a very short sentence, he said, if it's a good thing. We want it, referring to the bomb. If it's a bad thing, why do you have it? So, it, so there is, there is really, there is really something to be said about the inherent, you know, injustice of this regime, where the, where the, the states that have nuclear weapons are, are the ones that, that are claiming the moral high ground and, and, and the righteousness to demand of others that they, that they refrain from, from, from this context. Uh, Yes, and India. Can you repeat the question because I can't always hear what's come back there? Yeah, beyond these governments, the other governments that uh, have a history of instability, like Pakistan was the example he used, also have nuclear weapons, and you don't, you don't see this level of scrutiny, uh, mm -hmm. uh, just to paraphrase, uh, on, on Pakistan. India, which is a rogue nuclear state outside of the NPT framework, and has hundreds of nuclear weapons. Not only don't you not only don't you say anything about it, but you actually sell them uranium because because and and Canada and 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 Canada sells them uranium. So the the paradox, and this is just a side note, the great paradox is that the the nuclear suppliers group, which is this grouping of of states that are engaged in the nuclear industry and 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 sort of authorize who you can do deal with, deals with, and and the mantra has long been that you don't deal in nuclear energy with with states uh, outside of the NPT, outside of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, among other reasons to encourage universalization. You know, a bit of carrot and stick. If you're not in, then you don't get the benefits. And the Nuclear Suppliers Group was created directly as a result of the first Indian nuclear test in 74. You fast forward a few decades, and, and the first and only state for which the, the Nuclear Suppliers Group has granted a, a trade exemption is India, because all of a sudden there's a, there's a lucrative contract to sell them ura Canadian uh, uranium. So, so yeah, those are the, 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 the contradictions uh, inherent in the nuclear disarmament regime. In terms of the bigger picture, is this a nuclear legacy we were expecting from Obama in particular? When, when uh, and, 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 and I will go back to, to, to the remarks I said at the very beginning, this agreement should be welcomed, this is a good agreement, this is, but it should be taken as, uh, it should be understood as part of a microcosm, you know, it, in, 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 in isolation, yes, it's good, it's necessary, it's important, it should be welcomed, and the consequences of inaction could have been dire, and the alternative could have been war, so, so yeah, it was necessary. But those of us who, who have, for some time, worked on, on, on or followed these issues uh, somewhat regularly in terms of, of nuclear abolition, we were encouraged, you know, by Barack Obama. He got, he was he was uh, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, and and uh, he had given a speech in Prague when when, for once, an American president spoke of a world free of nuclear weapons, and people's eyes lit up, and and uh, mine included, and and people were like, well, maybe this is the guy, maybe this is the guy that's going to really push this abolition issue and, 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 and certainly not within his, his, his limited, you know, the time frame of his pre presidency, but really set the, ground, uh, the groundwork, set, get the wheels in motion that, that may eventually lead to, um, to abolition. A few months later, after the Prague speech, he was awarded the, the, the Nobel Peace Prize. And everybody acknowledged that, that it was not based on, on the actions thus far at that moment, but more on the promise of, of what might come <laughs> afterwards. And he went there and, and, and gave his, his speech. And, and in, the, in the nuclear abolition mo movement, we even spoke of the Obama moment. And there was this moment of, of renewed enthusiasm because of the speech, because of the Peace Prize. You know, maybe this is it. The time has come. Uh, the, the nuclear abolition is coming. So this 
I would argue that, you know, his legacy, uh, as it relates to nuclear disarmament, as it relates to nuclear abolition, could have been much more than the Iran deal. But, and not only, not only does the Iran deal, I think, fall short of the expectations that, 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 that some of us might have, but it actually has a, a bit of a counterproductive effect in that it further entrenches the, 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 the divisions. It further, further entrenches this notion that nuclear weapons are acceptable for some but not for others. It further entrenches the, 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 the reality that, uh, that the very states that have nuclear weapons are the ones that are pointing fingers and, and, and are the ones that are demanding of others that they disarm. So I think that from that perspective, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a bit unfortunate. I mean, it, it could have been so much more, but, uh, but, uh, but it wasn't. I mean, and, and uh, the, you know, many years from, from now, looking back, I mean, that, I think it's, 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 the, it's, it's going to be a mixed bag, as, as, as one might say. Yes, we prevented what could have been a catastrophic military flare-up because of the Iranian deal, uh, and, and we stopped proliferation in, in, in that, if that, if, if that was the course that it was going to be taking. But, at the same time, it was, fund, uh, it was founded on a very unjust international order in which the states that have nuclear weapons are the ones that demand of others that they should not, that they should not um, acquire them. So just yesterday, I mean, there's a Twitter handle for you, those of you who follow it. There's one specifically for the Iranian deal. And there was a, a tweet, uh, you know, quoting President Obama saying that, uh, welcoming the deal and, and saying that the Iranian deal uh, uh, strengthens the prohibition against nuclear weapons, that it strengthens the prohibition against nuclear weapons. I thought that was, you know, a bit of an overstatement because it, 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 it strengthens the prohibition against nuclear weapons in certain hands, but not, uh, but not uh, in their own. So I will leave it at that. And, and again, I hope this gives you a general idea of, of, the, of the sort of dynamics at play in, in surrounding the, the nuclear deal with Iran. And there is some time for, for conversation and, and, and Q&A. So thank you.